Did you know for an entire two years, Kobe Bryant did not say a single word to his starting point guard? That after Smush Parker asked Kobe an innocent question about football, Kobe responded with, He told me one day in practice, I tried to talk to him outside of, you know, basketball about football. He looked at me in practice and was dead serious and said, you can't talk to me. You need more accolades under your belt before you come talk to me. After saying this, Kobe never spoke to Smush off the court again. And this beef ran even deeper when asked about Smush after his time with the Lakers. Kobe responded with, He's playing in China right now, right? Maybe he'll get back to the NBA one day, see what it's like up close. The question is, why? Why did Kobe Bryant despise Smush Parker to the level where he did not say a single word to him for two years? And after those two years, what changed in Kobe's mindset that turned him from a leader who did not talk to his own starting point guard to a veteran star who won two more titles? What's up, Mike here? And Kobe Bryant's problems with his teammates and the media did not begin in 2005. Before 2005, we had the very open Shaq vs. Kobe beef, as well as the college Colorado court case. With both of these situations, Kobe went from a media darling to one of the most hated on and criticized players in the league as he spent the 2004 season flying back and forth between court cases and NBA basketball games. Despite these on-court controversies though, the 2004 Lakers started with a 21-3 record and were called by many as a candidate for the best team ever. On this team, Kobe and Shaq were joined by Hall of Famers Carl Malone and Gary Payton, two veterans who were looking for their first ring late in their careers. The problem was, despite this hot start, by the 2004 season, the Kobe and Shaq saga had truly gotten to an unthinkable level. In an interview with Jim Gray before the 2004 season began, Kobe called Shaq fat and out of shape, and Shaq did not take this well. Still though, this was old news. Kobe and Shaq had been arguing like brothers since they had began playing with each other. They had even called each other out publicly like this before. So what was different in 2004? Women. In Kobe Kobe's infamous Colorado court case. He made headlines when he told police he should have done what Shaq does, pay the women to say nothing, and that Shaq had already spent $1 million of hush money in situations like this. Shaq was married with children when this news broke, and he felt that Kobe had gone way too far and broken a code, which meant at a summer workout, Shaq tried to attack Kobe. Kobe stated that he told the police this off the record, and then they sold him out to the tabloid so it wasn't his fault. Regardless of what you believe, we had a literal soap opera and through it all, the Lakers did end up choosing Kobe above everyone. Because after Los Angeles was dominated in a five game NBA finals loss to the Pistons, the Lakers did break it up. And just because he was clearly the most likely candidate to make a trade demand, the media blamed Kobe when Shaq was traded to the Miami Heat. However, it would later turn out that both of them had demanded trades. And to be fair to Kobe, Shaq not only demanded a trade after it was said that Phil Jackson was not returning, but also he had demanded a trade in the 2001 season after a win because he did not shoot enough. So Shaq was not exactly the most stable superstar in the league. But guys, before we continue, I am very excited to thank our friends at DraftKings for sponsoring today's video. Because as we all know, it is the best time of the year, I think. Basketball is back. And that means, of course, DraftKings has us covered. All new customers who bet $5 will get $200 in bonus bets instantly instantly stay in on the action and use your $200 to bet on any time touchdowns DraftKings is the place to bet on touchdowns and if sports betting is still not available in your state you can still join in on all the fun on DraftKings Daily Fantasy where you have a shot to win cash prizes so make sure to go download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now new customers again bet just $5 on any wager and get $200 in bonus bets instantly that is personally what I'll say just an incredible deal that's promo code Corzemba only only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Again, thank you to DraftKings for sponsoring today's video. And for now, let's get back into the video. The problem was the return Los Angeles got back for Shaq was just not enough to keep them in contention. While the Miami Heat would grow to an eventual NBA champion with the addition of Shaquille O'Neal, the Lakers received back just Karan Butler, Brian Grant, Lamar Odom, and a 2006 first round pick, a package that would see them completely bottom out before an unlikely slash amazing trade would eventually save them. That is where our story truly begins. The 2005 season, one year before 
before Smush Parker officially joins the team. The 2005 Lakers are remembered for their tremendous failures. What gets forgotten is their hot start and playoff aspirations. Under the leadership of head coach Rudy Tomjanovich and with the motivation to show the world that they did not need Shaq, Los Angeles jumped out to a 24 and 19 start behind 27.5 points, 6.6 assists, and 6.3 rebounds per game from Kobe. 25 year old Lamar Odom emerged as a reliable option at the power forward position with a double double 15 one points and 10 rebounds per game. And this 2005 team was also highlighted by a young Karan Butler before he became an all star with the Washington Wizards and Chucky Atkinson, who manned the point guard spot for one season before LA brought in Smush Parker. Despite this success, the off court drama was still there though, as the fallout from Kobe's court case continued to follow him and to make things worse. Phil Jackson, Kobe's former coach, wrote a book in which he called Kobe next to uncoachable, stating Shaq was a player who would pout at criticism but make the changes needed, while Kobe would smile at any remark, say he understood, and then do whatever Kobe wanted. It was official. The media had turned on Kobe, and while Los Angeles began this season respectfully, Shaq, Dwayne Wade, and the Miami Heat began their season with a statement. By Christmas Day, Miami was seen as a top championship contender at 21 and 7, and Shaq had people wondering if LA had made a mistake. On this Christmas Day, Kobe and Shaq would play each other for the first time as rivals, and the NBA knew what they were doing. This Staples Center matchup drew the highest views in a regular season game since 1998, and the players would put on a show. Jumping into this one with just over three minutes left, the score is tied when Kobe rises up and draws a foul. He would knock down both free throws, but on the other end, there was Shaq with a dunk to tie things up. Then with time winding down, Dwayne Wade would isolate with a chance to win it. They waited too long, they waited long. They got, Wade, the shot, right on the side, missing. Overtime. Up two with time running down in this game. Miami failed to get a shot up, which meant Los Angeles and Kobe had the ball with an opportunity to win. The inbound. Bryant gets double. Kobe Bryant. <laughs> Amazing that it didn't go in. With this miss, Kobe would finish with 42 points, but didn't score a single point in overtime. An omen for what the 2005 Lakers would become as a whole. A team that had a hot start, but an ice cold finish. As while they did start at 24 and 19 with Rudy Tomjanovic, when Tomjanovic resigned due to health problems and overall exhaustion, suddenly the Lakers plummeted. In their last 29 games, they went just 10 and 19, giving them an overall record of 34 and 38, which meant for the first time since 1994, the Lakers would watch the playoffs from home. And to make matters even worse, Kobe watched as Shaq almost brought the Miami Heat all the way to the NBA Finals before Miami fell to the Detroit Pistons in the Eastern Conference Finals in seven games. The headlines that offseason were vicious. Kobe was selfish. He should have never forced Shaq out of LA. The Lakers should have picked Shaq over Kobe. A lot was said that summer, but the focus of our story is on Kobe's leadership and his relationship with his teammates. In terms of leadership, Kobe's growth in that area of life would largely benefit from a massive off-season move. The Lakers were bringing back Phil Jackson, even with his new book. It was official, Phil Jackson was back, he was going to save LA, and during that summer, Los Angeles also made a small move that would grow into a headline maker. As a largely unknown Smush Parker signed with LA on a two-year deal that paid him less than $1 million a season after Parker had an impressive training camp. Smush Parker wouldn't mind. He had fought on two different teams to secure a role, and after practice after practice of impressive play, 24-year-old Smush Parker was picked by Phil Jackson as the Lakers surprise starter of the year. From unknown free agent to starting point guard of the Los Angeles Lakers, this should have been a celebrated underdog story, only it was here where Smush's problems with Kobe would begin. Smush claims that after a few games of starting, he figured it would be okay to get some friendly banter going with Kobe, and so he asked Kobe about football. To this, Kobe would respond, What would you say your thoughts are now on Kobe Bryant? Yeah, we didn't have much of a relationship or a friendship, but who did at that time? He told me one day in practice, I tried to talk to him outside of, you know, basketball about football. He looked at me in practice and was dead serious and said, you can't talk to me. You need more accolades under your belt before you come talk to me. From here on out, during their time with the Lakers, Smush says that Kobe never spoke to him again off the court, which is an absolutely insane thing to do to your teammate, especially when you are supposed to be the leader of the team. So why did this happen? Gilbert Arenas has a solid theory. He probably randomly called Smush five in the morning and said, hey, yo, I'm training. 
where you at? And Smush didn't come. You don't drop whatever you're doing for this? Yeah. I don't respect you anymore. When he had like this thing against you, when he challenged you, when he put out a challenge, you didn't accept it. From there, he don't respect you. What's he gonna do? Yeah, Kobe's right. You were on the radio station for 35 minutes. Yeah. I'm sure he yeah. did. I mean, I gave him his little 30 minutes of fame again, man. He's playing in China right now, right? He's going over there in a couple months. Maybe he'll get back to the game one day. See what it's like up close. As not only did Kobe not talk to Smush again, but he also, as we saw, went as far as to make fun of Smush by asking if he was now playing in China. On Kobe's side, he still had a lot of growing up to do as a leader. Was this some sort of Jedi mind trick to try and push Smush? Probably. But different players respond in different ways, and Smush would say the following. When you heard him say that, how'd you feel? Uh, uh I felt small, felt a little disrespected. Having your starting point guard feel small and disrespected next to you is not not going to get you anywhere. And why did Kobe not respect Parker's journey to the NBA? After playing in Greece just years before, in the 2006 season, at the age of 24, Smush would start all 82 games for the Lakers and averaged 11.5 points and 3.7 assists per game on 44% shooting. Not great numbers, but not all-time terrible. In comparison, Derek Fisher is known as a Lakers legend, and in 2003, Fisher started all 82 games. In those 82 games, he averaged 10.5 points, 3.6 assists per game on 43.7% shooting. It's likely that when we look at these numbers, Kobe's disdain for Smush Parker had nothing to do with Smush Parker at all. It is instead very probable that Kobe was very mad that Shaq was winning at the highest level, and so Kobe, who was in no mood for underdog stories, took his anger out on the people around him. It's been said during the 2006 season that Kobe was not a fun teammate to be around at all. He was mad at everyone. The front office in particular had messed up. They believed Kwame Brown, once a number one pick, still had potential, and so they traded away Chucky Atkinson and Karan Butler in order to get him. The problem was that in just two seasons, Karan Butler would become an all-star, while Kwame Brown, in two seasons, would continue to be terrible. So on a team he disliked with a front office he did not believe in, Kobe decided he was going to go out shooting. For the year in 2006, Kobe put up a career-high 27.2 shots a game, and with this amount of shots, we had some historic performances. On December 20th, 2005, through a combination of jumpers and drives to the basket, Kobe would finish the first quarter against the Mavericks with 15 points on 7 of 8 shooting. Mavericks star Dirk Nowitzki could only watch in awe as Kobe continued to attack, and in the third quarter alone, Kobe would score 30 points to give him 62 points through three periods. More than the Mavericks' entire team. This was the first time one player had out scored a team through three quarters in the shot clock era. And this was no bum team. This was a Dallas Mavericks team that would lose in the 2006 NBA Finals. To make this an all-time legendary night in a move of pure sportsmanship, Kobe decided to sit out the fourth quarter as the game was out of hand. The fans hated this. If Kobe had kept going, he could have scored 80, 90, maybe even 100. Fans wanted to see what Kobe was capable of. And almost exactly one month later, we saw it, where we would see Kobe Bryant's best regular season game against the 2006 Toronto Raptors, a team who won just 27 games and were playing older veterans such as Jalen Rose. In the first half against the Raptors on January 22nd, 2006, Kobe had 26 points and it looked like he was on pace for another 50-point night, which was nothing new. Only nobody could expect what would happen next. In the second half, Kobe caught fire and he would end up making 18 of 28 shots in the second half alone. James has 22 on the night. Knocked away by Kobe. Great hustle by Kobe. He's going to score. And dunk Lakers lead. Five. For three again. Yes! <laughs> well, there's 70. Kobe guarded by Mo Peterson. Kobe pump fake for two. Kobe stopped the Lakers record. <laughs> this would be 18 for 20 from the line. And an 81 point game. Ladies and gentlemen, you have witnessed the second greatest scoring performance in NBA history. Yeah, I'll have a, uh, a, a vodka martini. How many olives would you like? 81.
The second half included six three-pointers, and by the time this night was over, Kobe Bryant had scored 81 points, still the second most in NBA history behind Wilt Chamberlain's 100. We need to remember at this point in time, Kobe Bryant had still not won a single MVP award, and as a basketball player now, individually, Kobe's game was seemingly better than it had ever been before, but when the 2006 MVP was announced, Kobe wasn't even in the running. 35.4 points, 5.3 rebounds, and 4.5 assists per game on 45% shooting was not even enough to crack the top three as the voting went Steve Nash, LeBron, Dirk, then Kobe. Many have argued after this season that Kobe's scoring greatness should have earned him the MVP award. However, the NBA was in a period of time where wins were weighed heavily in the voting, and so Kobe on a 45-win Lakers team was outshadowed by Nash's 18 8 points and 10.5 assists on a 54 win championship contender in the Phoenix Suns. This meant Steve Nash won the MVP for the second straight season, but if we dive deeper into this season, we find just how remarkable Kobe's season truly was from a scoring standpoint. In the 2006 season, teams shot just 79 shots a game compared to the 88.9 shots a game they averaged in 2024, which means if we were to adjust Kobe's points in 2006 to 2024's pace of play, we'd see Kobe Kobe averaged 39.8 points per game, but it was Nash who won his second MVP while Kobe stayed a zero time winner at this point in time. And while this vote was not official in the first round of the playoffs, the speculation was there that Nash was going to take home the MVP over Bryant, which set the stage for an incredible first round playoff show. As in round one of the 2006 playoffs, we had the Lakers taking the court against the number two seed Phoenix Suns. In this series, we also had a mystery in game seven that if it's true does not exactly shed the best light on kobe bryant we're going to get there as for game one in this series the lakers began the fourth quarter tied and in this fourth kobe would give us 10 points but in the process he shot just three for 11. meanwhile phoenix caught fire from deep as tim thomas hit back-to-back -back threes then came spark plug leandro barbosa and finally steve nash capped off a shooting display that locked down game one for phoenix it was obvious here though kobe in la could hang with Phoenix. This was not going to be an easy series for the Suns, and our man Smush Parker even had a promising 15 points in game one. Kobe, though, through it all, continued to not talk to really any of his teammates at all. He was in an isolated zone where he thought he would operate best, and also, he really did think this way of playing was best for the team. He wasn't doing it to win awards or to make more money or anything bad. Obviously, though, the rest of his teammates did not respond well to this. The thing is, though, when you win basketball games, people put up with this kind of persona, and in game two in Phoenix, a balanced attack including nine first half points from Kwame Brown and six second quarter points from Smush Parker led to a surprising 15 point Lakers first half lead. Then in the second half, Kobe closed the door with 19 second half points, which included a statement dunk over MVP Steve Nash. Look at the hustle of Lamar Odom, off to Kobe Bryant! for two or let's see yep counted for two and a foul suddenly we had ourselves a series and the media jumped back onto kobe's side especially after in game three even his role players were stepping up for him three separate lakers starters luke walden lamar odom and kwame brown finished with double doubles in points and rebounds in game three and none other than smush parker led the lakers in scoring with 18 points suddenly in the 2006 playoffs the los angeles lakers were playing on a new level and Phoenix needed to stop their momentum quickly before things got out of hand. In game four with 12.6 seconds left, it looked like they had done so, as after Boris Diaw knocked down a free throw to give the Suns a five point lead. Phoenix thought they were tying this series up, only Smush Parker would not let the Lakers die. Smush Parker puts up the three. Oh, wow. puts it in. And then came Kobe Bryant. They'd love to get it into Nash's hands, and they do. They do. Ball knocked away, stolen by Parker. Oh, there it is. Here comes George to Kobe Bryant. Bryant inside. It's good. It's good. Tie game. A three by Smush Parker, a steal by Smush Parker, a layup by Kobe. It is a tie game, and somehow Kobe still won't ever speak a word to Smush. He was there for the battle. As down three late again, the Los Angeles Lakers would just not give up. Lakers are out of timeouts. Oh, he's, he's going, he's going, going for the two out. inside. A one point game. Walker can tip it. 
Bryant with the save. Oh, you got to get a shot here. Final seconds. Bryant for the win. Bang! The 2006 Lakers were at their peak, suddenly against what was seen as a juggernaut in the Phoenix Suns. Los Angeles was up 3-1 to one and Kobe Bryant had led them to greatness. That is what people focused on. Smush Parker had his own great moments. They went completely unnoticed. Smush Parker's failures would not go unnoticed. As after these incredible wins, we had a tremendous drop-off. The Lakers would lose both games 5 and 6 and the media yet again flip-flopped on Kobe. Kobe Bryant was the problem again. Again, he was a ball hog. You can never win with a ball hog. That is all anyone heard, and for the first time in a long time, Kobe let the media get under his skin and did something that I will say is pretty unforgivable if you are his teammate. As after players like Smush Parker shot 1 for 7 in game 5 and 0 for 5 in game 6, Kobe Bryant wanted to make a point to the media, a selfish point. He was going to show everyone what happened when Kobe didn't shoot the ball. Did something happen in the locker room of game seven of this game that is unknown it has never been reported what is known is that in the first half of game seven the phoenix suns built a lead off of the great play of steve nash boris diaw and sean marion the lakers would head to the locker room trailing by 15 which meant a comeback was still possible and at this point in time kobe bryant was playing completely normally in fact he was having a great game with 23 points on 8 of 13 shooting but in the third quarter Kobe refused to shoot. Same story in the fourth, in the second half of the 2006 playoffs. In game seven, Kobe Bryant shot just three times as he passed the ball again and again to his teammates. He had made his point, the Lakers did need him to shoot to win, but really, this was more of a sign that his ego had gotten out of control. To Kobe, making a personal statement was more important than his teammates, the fans, his organization, a lot of people. In fact, this type of mindset from your lead star player seems like an unwinnable situation. So the question is, in a very short period of time, what would change in Kobe's mindset in order to get him to win two more titles? Especially because Kobe was getting very antsy as the 2006 season had ended with Shaq holding up an NBA championship trophy for the fourth time. Looking at the 2007 season, as they often do in life, things got worse before they got better. At least from a team perspective. Individually, the 2007 season was was a masterful display of scoring from Kobe Bryant. To begin this year, Kobe would officially change his number to 24 from 8, publicly displaying a death of his old self, and instead, we now had the Black Mamba, a calm, cool killer. And that is what we saw in 2007, as Kobe took on the world and put on a one-man show. Kobe would score 65 points against the Blazers. Belong to the Blazers. Now Kobe for the tie. Got it! Did it again! Ties it at 98, they gave the three-pointer. Penetration on the fall away. Yes! Kobe, hard to believe. Are you kidding me? Unreal! Are you kidding me? 60 against the Memphis Grizzlies, 58 against Charlotte, 53 twice against Houston. When it was all said and done, in the 2007 regular season, Kobe had 10 or more games with 50 or more points. 2007 Kobe was the true definition of scoring greatness, but his team was again, not winning on the level that he wanted and his anger showed. Bryant in 2007 would make a few headlines due to hard or flagrant fouls, most notably when he hit Manu. Ginobili in the face and his anger could not be more apparent after a five game loss to the Suns in the first round of the playoffs. It was official. In this offseason, Kobe Bryant was demanding a trade. Only the Lakers just refused to give in and they decided that because Kobe was under a long term contract, they were just not going to trade him and they were just going to make the roster better and instead of giving Kobe what he wanted in terms of a trade, they were going to give him what he wanted in terms of talent. Now Lamar Odom continued to be a walking double-double. Andrew Bynum had risen to become one of the best young centers in the league. Los Angeles, though, was still missing a true secondary star next to Kobe, but that would change on February 1st, 2008. As on that day, the Lakers were able to trade Kwame Brown, Javars Crittenton, Mark Gasol, Aaron McKee, a 2008 first-round pick, and a 2010 first-round pick for all-star Pau Gasol. Los Angeles was already 29-16 and 16 at this point in time.
moment in time. Gasol took them to the next level. It is here though where I wanna say we get the ultimate twist to this story. In terms of leadership and how he treated Smush Parker, Kobe never really learned his lesson or paid any real price for treating Parker this way. Reportedly, after an argument in practice in 2015 with Jeremy Lin, 36-year-old Kobe did not speak to Lin for the rest of the season. So obviously, Kobe did not change his ways. He still was willing to give teammates the silent treatment. The biggest difference between the 2006 and 2009 Lakers was, yes, a talent upgrade in Pau Gasol, but also players such as Pau Gasol were willing to respond to Kobe's extremely tough treatment. After his 2006 MVP snub, the 2008 season was finally Kobe's, as with 28.3 points, 6.3 rebounds, and 5.4 assists per game on the top seeded Lakers. Kobe won his first and only MVP of his career, and the Lakers had their sights on an NBA championship. Now we need to remember, at this point in time, Kobe still had his own sights set on passing Michael Jordan in number of championships won. In fact, after the 2008 season in 2009, Kobe finished second in the MVP voting, then in 2010, he finished third. Kobe also finished third in 2007, which meant Kobe's overall resume as a player really was on the verge of Jordan-esque greatness. Obviously, Kobe is remembered as one of the best to ever play, but imagine if he had just put up a few more points and grabbed a few more rebounds and grabbed two more MVPs in the process. He was inches away. And if the Lakers had closed the 2008 NBA Finals, Kobe would have matched the amount of rings Michael Jordan had for his career as well. Kobe would forever be haunted by the 2008 playoffs, but the Lakers did start out as one of the best playoff teams we have ever seen. Keeping in mind that the 2008 Western Conference was stacked to the point where all eight playoff teams were 50 win teams in the first round against the Denver Nuggets featuring Carmelo Anthony and Allen Iverson, an experiment that did not work. Kobe averaged 33.5 points per game as the Lakers swept through a team that did win 50 games. Then in the second round against the Jazz, things appeared to be going very well as Los Angeles won three of their first five games. However, in game six, the Lakers would enter the fourth quarter leading 86 to 70 before they completely collapsed. The Jazz would have a chance to make history after a massive comeback, but luckily for the Lakers, the Jazz would miss both of their three-point attempts to tie the game. Kyle Corbett, gonna be Okor for the tie. Real short, Williams, can they get the stop? Yes, that'll do it. Meaning the Lakers had survived and up next were the San Antonio Spurs who had given the Lakers plenty of trouble before. This included the 2003 Western Conference semifinals where the Spurs ended the Lakers chance for a four piece. So we were supposed to have a back and forth matchup only at this point in time, Kobe and Gasol were just on another level. The Lakers won in five games, giving us a 2008 NBA Finals classic between the NBA's original rivalry, the Los Angeles Lakers versus the Boston Celtics. The Celtics had struggled through the Eastern Conference Finals in order to get to the Lakers. So again, we were supposed to have a back and forth matchup. The 2008 NBA Finals were as hyped up as they could possibly be. Only by game six, the Celtics had a chance to eliminate the Lakers and they did so in an absolute blowout. The reason for this and the dominant series by the Celtics in general was that suddenly for the Lakers, Kobe was a one man show again. Shot clock at five on the pull up. Puts it up, puts it in. I don't like the shots the Lakers are getting. Ball knocked away by Bryant. Here he goes down the other end. Puts it in. Lakers by four. It's a very good post defender. Shot clock at three. Bryant trying to draw a foul. Puts up a three. And again. Looks up at the shot clock. Pierce guarding in. Kobe Bryant nails it. In the 2008 Finals, Kobe averaged 25.7 points per game on 40% shooting, while no one else, not even Pau Gasol, averaged more than 15 points per game. Meanwhile, Boston's big three of Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, and Ray Allen were collectively unstoppable. Pierce to Garnett. Garnett inside. Backs it in. And a foul. A lot of play from Kevin Garnett. And the 
the Celtics go up by 20. On both ends of the floor, he has put this team on his back. Pierce, that's a three. It's good. Paul Pierce. Bottom hopefully will be healthy next year. Ray Allen for three. Ray Allen in the ball game. Find a way to get these guys a well-deserved ovation. Ray Allen, another three. All three players averaged over 18 points per game, and it would take the Lakers another year of learning through loss before they won their first title after Shaq. After the Lakers lost to the Celtics in the 2008 finals, Kobe felt Pau Gasol's soft play was the reason why they lost. So in the Olympics against Spain and Pau, Kobe not only went out of his way to be extremely physical with Pau, but also after beating Spain and after winning the 2008 gold medal, Kobe to begin the 2009 season, put that gold medal on Pau Gasol's chair and asked Pau, are you going to lose a third championship or are you finally going to win? Pau Gasol responded to this type of treatment. Smush Parker did not. As for Smush Parker, after the 2007 season, Smush would sign with the Miami Heat, but his play fell off as he averaged just 4.8 points per game in Miami and was waived by the team in March. The Clippers did pick up Smush for the end of the season, but let him go when the year was over, and with that, Smush Parker would never play in the NBA again. The thing is, forever. Kobe acted as if Smush had done something personally wrong to him just by existing near him. In 2012, Kobe said Smush Parker shouldn't have been in the NBA, but the Lakers were too cheap to sign a real point guard. Yikes. As for the ending of Kobe and Smush Parker's relationship, do we have a happy ending? It turns out the answer is yes and no. Because back in 2014, Smush Parker's pastor, who is a master massive Kobe Bryant fan, asked Smush if he could ask Kobe for some gear. So Smush wrote Kobe a letter apologizing to Kobe, trying to reconnect and mend things while asking if his pastor could get an autograph or some gear or something. And Kobe responded with the sign gear for the pastor, but he did not write back to Smush at all. Yet again, choosing silence in his relationship with Smush, something Smush Parker knew all too well. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you are new to the channel, make sure to subscribe and turn on post notifications. That way you never miss a video. And also, I really think you're going to like this video in the top left on Caitlin Clark and why she's having one of the most historic seasons ever, or this video in the top right that YouTube is recommending specifically for you.